So we are in Maywood, Illinois, uh, the Wood, fame Maywood, Illinois. Uh, we're on the 800 block of 17th Avenue in Maywood in front of Chamber Fred Hampton's childhood home. Uh, this is where he grew up, directly across the street from Irving Middle School. Uh, so this is a famed establishment. This is a famed house. A lot of history, of course, that took place in this house. The legacy is at this house. Uh, so Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., uh, who's the chairman of the Black Panther Party Cubs, you know, they're doing a lot of work in the community, doing a lot of work on the home to turn it into a museum uh, for educational and empowerment purposes for the community of Maywood. Right on, Free Mall, Free Mall, and beyond. You see they have the community gardens, they have the community fridge uh, that we're now opening up. This is gonna be the Hampton Home Community Fridge, uh, the first community fridge in Maywood, Illinois. Uh, and it's extremely important because food insecurity is a systemic issue. It's a pandemic that exists and Maywood is a food desert. Uh, so if we understand that means Maywood community members do not have access or right to produce uh, goods and services. So they have to go out of the community to grocery shop if they're not going to a corner store. So this is huge. The youth of Maywood have come out not only painting the fridge and providing the service, but they're also learning more about Chairman Fred Hampton and his legacy. Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. So it's extremely important this type of work and the education is readily seen. My name is Kiana Latimer. I live on the west side of Chicago. I'm a performer slash apprentice of Mad Rhythms Tap Dance Company. Mad Rhythms is a professional tap dance company. It gives back through the art of tap dance in the North Lawndale community and also the south side of Chicago. Dance is a form of expression and I'm not the most, I guess, outspoken person, but I felt like dance was really a, a tool that I used to express myself. I was exposed to so much at su such a young age because of dance. Me just being exposed made me know like I want better, I want to I want to do better, uh, and I want to be better. People honestly have lived on the west side have never been to Oak Park probably a day in their life and it's like a three five minute drive which is crazy but it's like a whole different environment. So uh, my, my hope is for my people to be exposed to healthy foods and what it can actually do for long-term health because if not I honestly feel like People in my community probably don't live probably past the age of 50 or 60 because of diabetes or high blood pressure. Diabetes definitely does run in my family. Food security is that all people at all times have access to food. And food insecurity is the lack of access. You fear you're going to run out of food and not have money to purchase more. Usually food insecurity and food access go together. So sometimes we, we talk about community food security. And that's where we get into the idea of geographic access. So where communities may lack geographic access and that's community food insecurity. In Chicago, in many other cities, you have a layering. You have households that are food insecure. That means that they lack economic access. And then they live in communities where you have low geographic access. So there's this layering, which makes it kind of a double threat. We see numerous patients for diabetes, along with high blood pressure, um, a lot of diet-related chronic diseases. The majority of our patients are seen at Stroger on the west side of Chicago. Food insecurity, and in particular nutrition insecurity, 
are definitely leading risk factors for diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and those are some of the top causes of death in the United States. Cook County started screening people for food insecurity in 2015. We found that one in seven residents in Cook County adults are food insecure. The statistics of kids with food insecurity is about one in six kids, so higher than adults, and probably worse in the summertime when school is not in session. Food insecurity in children has definitely been demonstrated to cause poor um, academic performance. Um, it also can cause behavioral issues, um, anxiety, depression um, when they're hungry, along with poor dental health, which can lead to long-term issues you know, that sometimes people don't really think about. Sometimes the food availability can be seasonal. Um, so in the summer when there's farmers markets who accept you know, SNAP benefits, there's a lot more accessibility. But then as Chicago is not warm for much of the year, some of the produce is just not readily available and the quality between different supermarkets is variable. You don't really have a choice sometimes when you have less, you don't have access to certain things, you don't have the money for it, um, so you do what you got. We don't have anyone investing our, in our community or anybody pushing that, that narrative to like live better, eat healthier, then you're gonna do what you gotta do. And especially if you have a family and you got kids, and then there's also like government resources, like welfare and everything. But you know, then there's also the stereotype of like, with black people, you, um, I guess, what's it called? Abusing the, the system, you know? And so people are like, well, they don't have sympathy for it. But they're working with what they have. The typical, the, the flaming hot chips, um, the little candies, I mean, but that, you can get that for like 50 cents. It's affordable, it's something quick, but you don't think long-term eating that. It could, because honestly, people in, in my community, that could possibly be their dinner, or that could possibly be their lunch. We have to kind of look at the whole picture. What do people need to get food? They need money or they need access to benefits, which is like money. They need a place to shop and spend that dollar so they can get the food that they need for their families. It's best if those options are local and close because then if it's not, they have to like carry bags long distances. Uh, they have to spend money to get on a bus or use money for gas to travel long distances. So that's the economic burden on families. In the communities that have really the best access, they don't only have a big box store, but they have specialty stores, they have farmer's markets, they have kind of a diversity of food options. And that diversity of food options, uh, that's really important because it helps people get the types of foods that are supportive of health. And that's what we want in communities. We want people to have money. We want people to have options of where they can purchase. And then the third thing that we want is that those food retail locations bring jobs and they also make a community vibrant. Um, for those at home, we are doing the burrito zucchini boats, so that's the recipe that you'll be getting your stuff out for, if you want to start getting that out while I'm talking. So me and Lynette will go back and forth like we typically do. For those that haven't been here before, we'll do the education, start the cooking. Cut this side right here so that it can just lay flat. Both sides? Yes, the both ends so that they're both flat, and then you're going to cut it down the middle. You can tell I don't cook too much. Right. <laughs> What's something that maybe has changed or something you do different since the last fresh table? The spaghetti squash spaghetti. That's like a favorite now here. <laughs> Scrape out a decent amount to get all the to get all your filling in. And save the middle too, okay? If you do have a link on EBT, any money you spend at the farmer's market, they give you coupons to have that free amount next time.
So in the summer, if you have a way to get to those places, I recommend getting all your fruits and vegetables at those places because it's pretty much free. Oh yeah, this, this, that one is, used to be a liquor store there and then it was torn down and the kids that go to the after school program next door said they wanted a grocery store, like a fresh market since the community didn't have fresh food. So it's, it's a youth brand like farmer's market and it's Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 2 to 6. It all started from like a peace circle and just really like talking about the uh, event with Joyce Ford and the riots and things that are going on and how the police could like benefit the community and just like bring everybody together honestly. All right, it was a lot of confusion going on um, and like we just wanted to have an outlet to like where we could talk um, our thoughts because we was just kids in the pandemic. First we was going to school and now we're at home every day. And we wanted to like have an outlet to like community leaders, athletes, and people to just show where our head is at. We're already a food desert. We don't have much, and we just want to provide um, a different narrative to the kids that's in Austin, and also the resources that we have. Yeah, it's not that it's not that accessible to the community, honestly. Like we gotta go right all the way up to like Oak Park or somewhere else to like find some like, grocery store and like have food like this. Because we're providing the blueprint. Because if we're the first to do this and we can do this successfully, other neighborhoods can do this too. I mean, everything that we do is moderation. The other thing is alcoholic beverages, <laughs> which tend to be very high in sugar and preservatives. Nobody wants to touch on that one. <laughs> Why is that, Nick? Oh, I didn't say me. I'm just saying the fact. <laughs> I did all my drinking and partying from 16 to 21. <laughs> and I got pregnant when I was 21, so... And then I got my diagnosis, so... I drink occasionally. Not like it used to be. And my nutritionist, um... Her reaction when I'm like, Oh, so I can drink Gatorade, right? Mm -hmm. And she was like, Nope. <laughs> They want me on a, like, a low sodium, low protein. Uh -huh. People might think the patients might not have energy to change or they might not give um, trust that the patients want to change. But uh, in my experience, I find that a lot of patients appreciate any extra time in the visit that can be spent on discussing food. Majority of patients would much rather, if they are given resources, time, and encouragement to change their nutrition or um, eat, a little bit more of a healthy diet, they would much rather do that than take more medication. But I think assuming that people do it, um, eat an unhealthy diet on purpose um, because they just don't want to change is never um, an assumption that should be made. I have like my grandmother, she's probably upper 80s. And like she's had a couple strokes and you know, she deals with issues with her body, but then it's like, she doesn't have access to the food that she needs right now like she needs fruits and vegetables but she doesn't have access to it it kind of puts you know more pressure on my family members because now we have to find like what she needs and help prepare it and because it's not in the community we have to go out and so i feel like that makes it harder especially for people who do have um health issues when you see people in the grocery store and they're buying like super super processed stuff and you're like you can see Oh, this is a mom who has kids and she's literally trying to do her best. Um, she just doesn't have the information or the time and, or the resources, yeah. Because not all like local groceries have the best pricing, especially like when COVID hit really bad. Um, I know like the grocery store that we had really close to us, the prices were really high, especially for like fruit or in a probably Hispanic community, the tortillas were really, really expensive. So I found myself going to Target for my groceries sometimes, which was out, out of my community. Like people encourage everybody to shop locally, but sometimes you just can't because you don't have that money for it. Like it just it doesn't work out. If you go to, let's say, a Whole Foods or even like Mariano that's in like Ukrainian village, it's more catered to a specific group of people and that's obviously that's amazing because they need that and we need it too 
So I just feel like each community should have their own because that's symbolic to that community and it tells the story and who the people are. And I think when we don't have those options, we just miss out on telling the full story. There's a variety of reasons of why we've come to sort of where we are. Racial segregation makes that easier. We can intentionally say, we're gonna invest resources here, but not here. Or we can say, oh, I think it's a little more risky here as compared to here. And a lot of that risk and that perception is rooted in things like racism. If you thought about the lack of food retail in some more affluent communities, those communities would demand more and their voices would be heard. There's other issues when it comes to ownership in communities. A lot of small black businesses, for example, if we're talking about the West Side, the disinvestment has made it hard for people to get capital. So say you wanna open a store and then you go, you need to get a loan to open that store. So that's also an issue when it comes to small businesses, particularly businesses in communities of color, is capital, investment, those factors. And then when you look at people in the community that want to develop businesses, and I've, I've met many people who wanted to open a store, and they talk about some of the challenges that they face, and mainly the challenge is getting capital. We did some research to see was there any other uh, plant-based restaurant in the community. Unfortunately, it's not. So uh, the people been giving us the title as being the first vegan restaurant on the west side. Yes, I believe it was. Uh, it'd be a good help just to have the alternative food choice in the community. We initially rented this place out. 2020 in March so that's when the pandemic kind of like took full flight yeah we were affected big time we didn't we didn't get to make any money basically we've been in the area since about 2003 and my family and I have seen the food disparity yeah, change a lot so we had a grocery store that's in the Washington mall down there uh, it started off Dominic's went Cubs went nothing at all. So we really didn't have any grocery store. But having this vegan restaurant over here helps to get rid of the whole health disparity. You know, people in the area eating fast food all the time, greasy food all the time. From block to block, you can find two or three like chicken restaurants, pizza restaurants. So going into the vegan diet has helped me health wise. And I think it's important in our neighborhood to have that because People that are vegan that do live in the neighborhood, they travel to the south side of Chicago or to the north side to get vegan food. And now they don't have to go very far because we're open. We just heard prophecy spoke about the school across the street. The eyes haven't seen and the ears haven't heard the great wonders of what Jesus Christ would do. So we just say thank you right now. We ask you to continue to cover this whole block with your blood. There's nobody like you. Continue to protect and shield him. Build a hedge around him. Do him like you did Job. We get ready to close this prayer and never leave your presence. We thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for all our sins. Bless this occasion. Amen. 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 We are here because of by design systemic issues that exist across our country. Food insecurity is a people made issue and we have people made solutions. Food insecurity exists. It's real. We are in a food desert right now. We are in a food desert right now. The people can't even stay in their own community. Their money can't stay in their own community. That's criminal. That's criminal. Freedom ain't free. So again, don't mistake, this fridge isn't the answer, but it's part of our fighting back and teaching so we can get to those systemic solutions. This impacts people for life. 
I can't count how many people who I've come in contact with my life with the present day and say they remember either the Black Panther Party Free Breakfast Program. So the Black Panther Party Free Breakfast Program fed a minimum of 3,500 children a week. And even by the federal government's own record, it's when the Black Panther Party was in existence, there was a record low, I repeat, record low to what they call black on black crime. The vice lords, the work at the Free Medical Center, the disciples of the Free Breakfast Program, it gave everybody some point, some role they could play. You know, my parents are here, my grandparents are looking down. The reason I'm here is because they taught true history. And, and learning about the Black Panther Party, learning about Chairman Fred Hampton and his legacy, his teachings, and initiatives like the Free Breakfast Program really changed my life. And then fast forward, here I am standing with Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., who's continuing the legacy with the Black Panther Party Cubs. I'm standing with Randy, uh, Best Proviso Township. I was born and raised here. Um, growing up in Maywood, um, as I got older, I became really, really upset, upset and annoyed at the fact that when I was in school, that they didn't teach us anything about Chairman Fred Hampton Sr. or the Black Panther Party. I was born in 68. So many, a few months later, that's why I didn't get the blessing of meeting the Chairman Fred Hampton Sr. And when he, when he left us, there's some things that went down in our community or things that didn't happen in our community that I know for a fact that would have happened if the Chairman Sr. was here. Anybody who has never been hungry, Anybody who has never been in a household where you don't have food in the refrigerator, when you don't have food in, the, in, your, in your shelves, they thumb their nose at what we're doing. They think we're enabling the community. Those, to those people, I say, we're in the battle, for, we're saving lives here. If you want to know what the issues are in our community, the issue is poverty. That's what we battle. The reality is, Maywood now has been infamously referred to as murder woods now, like they call Chicago Shadow Rap. We can keep on trying to dress this up, you know what I'm saying? We were about a week and a half ago, I was sitting here doing an interview. I heard I heard some shots. I thought, so I said, somebody banging on the door. We came outside. And young man was just murdered right, right down the street. But I was raised an issue about it. I felt someone staring at me. And it was like a, a, a two or three year old baby that was, that was right there. And the blood had splashed on the baby. And that, 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 that image was stuck in my mind. It was, again, this was a week and a half ago, right, right here. Whole communities create whole people. Society benefits from having whole people. And so we don't want to leave anybody behind. And I think the thinking of, oh, we can go far away and move far away from other people, we're realizing that that's not accurate. We can't move far away enough from our neighbors not to realize that we're all in this together. So we're talking about food, but it applies to everything because you also have social cohesion, you have less crime, community beautification. We can't think that this is how it always has been. So part of it is that the solutions are in the community because they were there. So we do need some support from outside, but we have to bring that together with what's happening inside. Residents have a history, there's a culture in communities, and we need to recapture that culture. They may not have capital, they may need capital, but this idea that people don't have creative solutions is not correct. And we work with a lot of community organizations that have very creative solutions, but what they need are policies and investment to bring those solutions to fruition. To cut through this red tape, it's gonna take the power of the people. What's up? Power of the people. Ain't no power like the power of the people. Ain't no, I'm, not, I'm not back and forth. I'm not arguing with the city council. What's up? Yeah. 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 Feed them all. Feed them all. Feed them all. Feed them all. Right on. Feed them all. Right on. Right on. Uh, the community being coming out, keeping the refrigerator full um, with fresh food, as you can see. Uh, that's still good. There's nothing being spoiled. People being taken what they need. Uh, people being coming in the garden. Last time you seen the garden was higher. I think it's a plus for the community right now. I think it's a good idea. Um, it came from the community, from the people. Where we It wasn't our idea, so we came with it. You know what I'm saying? They said, let's do it. And uh, let's keep on using the community with these ideas and let's save ourselves.
All right, this is a tribute to my grandfather. Jazz man Jack, jazz man Jack. He's got a way with the crowd with his musical sound. He's jazz man Jack, jazz man Jack. Oh Lord, jazz man Jack. Oh Lord, away with the crowd with that old school sound. He's jazz man Jack on three, on one. A two, a one, two, three, four. Ab man, jazz man, take it away. I play till my saxophone is all rusty and gray. You let my family your instruments by waving your hand to catch my vast collection of records. So mighty, so grand. The birth of cool conducts his band so high. And he rides the cold train till we're touching the sky. Whenever I'm feeling kind of blue, whenever I can't take charge, the jazz man will cannonball. Shoot me to the stars. I love supreme, the sweet melody that made me pick up my instrument to join the family business. This jazz cat commanded the utmost respect. When he swaggered to the stage, corny birds got wrecked. So what do you say, man? He said to me, I picked up my sax, I stepped up to the stage, there's no turning back. He said, saxophone solo to your heart's content. You help bent on proofing, you worked in the circle. I know you think you're ready for the jazz man, cause he is way too happy for the common man. And we are way too happy, slapstick happy, saxophone take it away. I know you think you're ready for the jazz man, cause he is way too cool for the common man. And we are way too chillin', sub-zero chillin', saxophone take it away. He's got a million CDs, a bunch of tapes and records, play it, saxophone, take it away.